Hello and welcome to uh, this week's edition of Case Law Corner, brought to you by Hordick Levitt Delella. I'm Dave Delella, uh, and we're going to talk about some case law today. The case I've chosen is YRSCC 1206 versus 520 Steels Developments Inc. Now, those of you that have been paying attention might be saying, well, wait a minute, Dave, didn't you do that case the last time you did a case law corner? And you'd be right. I'm not being lazy. This isn't a Groundhog Day in history repeating itself. Um, the reason why I'm touching on this case again is that it had a completely different aspect to it uh, that I want to discuss. Um, you'll recall that in this case it was a construction deficiency case where a number of defendants had been uh, sued as a result of some very expensive defects. In fact, 53 defendants in total. Uh, one of those defendants was Liberty uh, Development Corporation. Liberty, interestingly, was not the declarant. Um, they were not the construction management company. In fact, Liberty hadn't even entered into any contract uh, with respect to this uh, development. So you might be asking yourself, well, why were they named as a defendant? Well, as we know, what developers often do is they create some arm's length companies, some numbered companies. They'll create a, a declarant. Um, some have related uh, construction management companies that um, put up these projects. And this serves to insulate the uh, developers from liability. Okay, And oftentimes the declarant won't have any assets to satisfy judgment uh, for a deficiency action or otherwise. So despite this, plaintiffs often include the developers in their lawsuits. Um, why is that? Well, this case is a perfect example of why that is. Um, in this case, Liberty was sued as one of the defendants, and the plaintiff here argued that there was a sufficient connection that existed between Liberty and the construction management company to allow them to add Liberty as a defendant for several things, um, breach of contract, negligence, um, and also because of an entanglement that they uh, um, professed existed which created a joint liability. Okay, um, They had some interesting arguments. One of the arguments was that Liberty and the construction management company, which was Darkon, um, were closely held corporations they shared uh, the same office for their businesses. Many of the directors were the same directors in both companies. Um, and actually emails from uh, Darkon in many cases had originated from Liberty email addresses. So as a result of this, the plaintiff argued that they were so entangled that there was really joint liability, liability because Liberty was in fact the entity that was involved in the construction management. A further interesting argument they made was that a lot of the promotional brochures uh, that were put out actually referenced Liberty. And as a result of that, it gave the impression that Liberty was involved in the construction management of the project. So what happened? Well, ultimately, Liberty brought a summary judgment motion saying there was no genuine issue for trial related to their defense, which was that there was not a sufficient connection. Um, that summary judgment uh, motion failed. Uh, the court found that there actually was a genuine issue for trial and that there wasn't enough evidence on the motion to decide whether or not Liberty was, in fact, a proper defendant. So, what does this mean? Does this mean you should always include the developer in these type of cases? No, but it means your lawyer should be taking a very close look at the relationship and what's there to see if they should be, in fact, a defendant. So with that, that's this week's Case Law Corner. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time.